All right, hello. Welcome back to lecture. <laughs> um, so today we're going to be going over, let me share my screen for a second, going over lab five, EMG, very, very fun. Um, EMG, just to let you guys know, is not my specialty. If you have like really deep and concerning questions about EMG, uh, please ask Dom because she'll know the answer. Um, but I'm, I know the basics of it and I can answer really basic questions about it and basic questions about the, and I'll answer questions about the lab, of course. But uh, if you have something like very complicated to ask me, then uh, maybe you can ask me and then I'll refer you to Dom. <laughs> All right, anyway. So uh, before we start, I'm gonna remind you guys to watch this on two times speed because nobody's got time for regular normal speed. So yeah, we're gonna first start off with introducing EMG. So we're gonna introduce like basics of EMG. So we're gonna talk about the motor unit, action potentials, excitation contraction coupling, which is going to be super, super important for your test, just as a heads up. Uh, we're going to be talking about muscle contractions, so concentric, eccentric, isometric contractions, and then we'll talk about EMG stuff. Um, I'll talk about the methods, which you guys will see in the methods video. Uh, there is no purpose in my hypothesis. I forgot to take that out. Um, you guys will hopefully watch the methods videos so you can get your data. Um, <laughs> and then there's one calculation that I'm going to put up for you guys and that'll be it. And I don't think I, oh, I do have a John Cena, but it's probably covered up by my face. Um, so unfortunately you won't be able to see him. Okay. So we're going to go to the beginning, beginning, beginning basics of this. So what is a motor unit? Um, what is a motor neuron right here? So on the left right here is a picture of a motor neuron. It is composed of a cell body, the axon and the myelin sheath, and then the axon terminals. So basically the cell body receives the, um, the action potential, then the action potential is zoomed down through this axon and the myelin sheath acts as like a, how do I say this? As an accelerator, it makes the, the action potential go down the axon much faster. And I'll talk about that. I don't think we'll go too deep into it, but we'll talk about what happens down here at the end of the axon terminals. The axon ter terminals essentially give the, uh, the action potential to either the muscle or to another cell or, or uh, another neuron or anything like that. So um, this is the motor, motor unit, ooh, English. Um, okay, this is the motor unit. unit. <laughs> like I said, watch on two times speed. <laughs> um, this is basically where the motor neuron and the muscle fiber meet. Um, this is how the uh, muscle fiber like knows when to contract. So it'll get that like action potential from the motor neuron and then it will cause a series of events that I'll talk about soon. But yeah, this is what a little motor unit looks like. Action potential. So I said that a couple times. I'm not sure if you guys are super familiar with it, but the action action potential is basically um, like the how the cell like knows when to contract or whatever. So action potential is like voltage. It's like electricity. Think of it as kind of like organic electricity within your body. Um, and this is the action potential of a skeletal muscle right here on the left, while right here on the right is action potential of a uh, cardiac muscle. So you can see that there's a little bit of difference. You guys don't need to know like super specifics about this, but you can see right here 
that this action potential looks very different from this action potential. And uh, for cardiac muscle, why you think about why you wouldn't want the action potential to be looking like this, why you would want a more extended action potential. If you thought, oh, it's because you don't want like several action potentials to be happening at once, then you'd be correct. So the reason why you don't want several action potentials to happen at once is because you want the heart muscle to relax. You know, when the heart contracts, it sends blood out to the blood or to the lungs, or to the blood, did I say? <laughs> to the body, it sends blood out to the body or to the lungs. Um, and then when it relaxes, that's when it fills back up with blood to like send back out. So you want the heart to be able to relax. So that's why it has this little plateau phase. So it's unable to hit that action potential again. Okay, now we've kind of gotten to a very important part. Um, I have taken the liberty to go through this like series of events step by step because this is something that's super important for your exam and it's relevant to the lab. So I figure why not just spend time on it. So this is the excitation coupling contraction. And it's basically what we saw before, like in the first slide um, of the motor unit. And this right here, this is like a part of the motor unit. This is where the, uh, the nerve meets the muscle right here. This is the nerve right here. And then that's the muscle. This is the, the terminal ends axon terminal of the nerve. And then this is the muscle fiber right here. Um, so an action potential, the like electricity going through the nerve is actually sodium, like sodium moving through the nerve. So you'll see right here that sodium is entering the axon. And you can see the myelin sheath right here allowing for it to like enter, but that you don't really need to know that like super deep about it. Um, but basically uh, sodium is entering through voltage gated sodium channels. Important thing to know, like you can't, the voltage gated sodium channels are not drawn on here, like on this picture, but they're there. Pretend like each one of these arrows is a voltage gated sodium channel. Basically, sodium enters through this channel and then it goes down and then it triggers this channel to open. So it's kind of like a snowball effect. So once uh, sodium starts entering the axon, it'll trigger all the other voltage, gate, voltage gated channels to open up too. So that's how it does this little like, oh, sodium's here, it triggers this one and then let sodium in, it triggers this one, let sodium in, triggers this one goes kind of like that. Um, and this is called depolarizing. So that's going to be an important term to know. Depolarizing of the axon, making the axon more positive. All right, now we get down. So all of your little sodiums are going through the little motor neuron. And then eventually it'll go down to this bottom part of the axon, the axon terminal and it'll trigger these voltage gated calcium channels. So know the difference between those and know where each one of these are located. So voltage gated sodium channels are up here in the axon and then right here at the axon terminal is where your voltage gated sodium channels are, or calcium, voltage gated calcium channels are gonna be. So your sodium activates these voltage gated calcium channels and that allows calcium to enter the axon terminal. Once calcium enters the axon terminal, it'll interact with these little circles right here. These circles are vesicles. So vesicles, uh, next slide. These vesicles contain acetylcholine. And acetylcholine, the, these vesicles will, once they're activated, they'll go down towards the end of this axon terminal 
towards the membrane right here. And these vesicles will then release the acetylcholine and it'll release it into the synaptic space right here. This is important terms to know. So synaptic space right here at the end plate, the motor end plate, synaptic space, know those terms. Okay, so once acetylcho acetylcholine is uh, released into the synaptic space to the motor end plate, it'll then attach to these acetylcholine receptors on the motor end plate. See these like little dots right here? Um, these channels right here, they're closed before acetylcholine touches them. And once acetylcholine touches them, they open up. So once they sit on the receptors, these uh, channels will open up. And these are ligand gated ion channels. And those are, that's an important name to note. And this allows sodium to enter, enter the muscle cell. So enter sodium exit potassium, but mostly you really, all you really need to know is that sodium will enter through these ligand gated uh, ion channels. Okay, once sodium enters, it'll do the same thing that it did in the axon of the motor neuron. It'll keep going through these channels and then it'll hit these voltage gated sodium channels and it'll keep going, depolarizing the muscle. Uh, yeah, muscle cell action potential. So this depolarization continues down through these two T tubules. So you can see this is kind of like a wider picture out of it. Axon terminal right here, motor end plate. This is where the acetylcholine will exit and then sodium will enter through here depolarize, go through down to the T-tubule. This is a closer look of this. So this is the T-tubule right here and these voltage gated sodium channels right here. So sodium is entering, triggering this one, then it opens up to allow sodium to go in here, which will trigger this right here, which is a voltage gated calcium channel or a DHP receptor you'll know it as the DHP receptor. This DHP receptor will then trigger the ryanidine receptor, which will then allow the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium and will go on to cause muscle contraction. And I'll tell you how it does that. But this is really important to know. It's really important to know where each thing is located, where these voltage gated sodium channels are located, where this DHP receptor is located, the ryanidine receptor, and then the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And the sarcoplasmic reticulum has this storage of calcium. So um, it can, when it's activated, it can release it. And uh, then once it releases the calcium, calcium will bind onto tr troponin and troponin will cause tropomyosin to move. And the reason why it's causing tropomyosin to move is because tropomyosin, as you can see right here, is covering these little dots. And these little dots are myosin binding sites. And myosin, as you guys can remember, is these little heads right here. And these little heads, little myosin heads will bind, oops, will bind onto the uh, myosin binding sites, uh, onto the actin, and then it'll cause movement. So it'll move to the uh, sliding filament theory. So this is, it'll move like, kind of like this. As you can see, it contracts in this little gif. So boop, the sliding fil filament theory is the movement of the uh, actin and myosin right here. Um, and you should know that this is called a sarcomere, which is the smallest contractile unit. Okay, now we're gonna be talking about isometric, like the different contractions. So isometric contraction, um, the way it looks on this is 
there will be tension in this sarcomere, but there will be no movement. So isometric contractions are basically like, I have a weight right here, but no movement is happening. No change in the angle of the joint is happening. No change in the length of the muscle, nothing. Concentric contraction is the shortening of the muscle. So change in muscle angle, or not muscle angle, in joint angle and muscle shortening, concentric contraction. And this will be the movement of the sarcomeres. Eccentric contraction is the lengthening of the muscle. So the weight is causing the lengthening of the muscle and the change of the angle of the joint. And in the sarcomere terms, it'll be opening up the sarcomere, but there will be tension doing that. Okay, so this all relates to EMG, I swear. <laughs> um, what EMG is? So electromyography. So remember what I was talking about before? how um, action potentials is basically just electricity within your body. This measures that electricity. So as you can see, electromyography. So electricity of the muscles, and then you're like reading it. So you're, you're graphing it. Um, and basically it's the process and recording, analyzing, the electric signals within your muscles um, based off of the action potentials, like I just said. Um, benefits, it measures your activation of your muscles. So activation of your muscle fibers, it helps to like find and train, like find and train your muscles, train specific muscles. It could be used in research, rehab, ergonomics, and in sports science. And this is kind of what it looks like. I wish you guys could see it like in real life because it's kind of cool, um, but this is good too. <laughs> you guys can watch the methods video and hopefully that will, um, that will help. So factors affecting EMG, um, there's a number of things that affect it. Tissue type, so type one, type two muscle fibers um, could, affect it, but also like adipose tissue is like more conductive than like skeletal muscle. So tissue type. Um, crosstalk. So if you have, if you want to like look at one specific set of muscle fibers, like right here in the middle of the biceps, sometimes the muscle fibers like right over here on the side of the biceps will like interfere with that because they'll probably be working too during that muscle contraction, which may interfere with the reading. Uh, electrode site. So if you don't put your electrodes in the same place every single time, then that's not gonna be like as accurate because you're not gonna be reading the same muscle fibers. Uh, like this says, different sites will produce different EMG readings. And then external noise, so devices like cell phones and other kind of devices, maybe pacemakers will probably produce that kind of artifact. It's also affected by recruitment or so number of fibers that are being used and firing frequency. So how often the fibers are being used. So um, you guys don't really need to know these two little sections over here, you can if you're really curious. But right here, normal, so at rest, um, you're not contracting your muscle fibers, so there isn't gonna be really much of a signal right here. Um, with a little bit of effort, you can see just a little bit of like of signal, a little bit of uh, some fibers being used. Sorry, my dog is like scratching at the door. Um, and then right here with a lot of effort, you can see that there's a strong signal right here. Okay, so at rest, theoretically the muscle should be like turned off like it was before right here at rest. But in unhealthy individuals, 
they could stay on. So right here, they could stay on. I don't think this is uh, um, <laughs> for healthy and unhealthy individuals. Um, but yeah, due to like pain, stress, anything like that, that could cause uh, muscle fibers to fire or the action potentials within the muscle fibers to occur. Um, okay, so then we're gonna talk about concentric and eccentric, the difference between that in EMG concentric, you can see right here in this little picture that there's a lot more activation as compared to eccentric right here because as the sarcomeres are getting longer and longer, there's gonna be less of an ability to use that muscle fiber because as you get to like a certain uh, length, it's not gonna be able to be as used. So this is like a passive movement. You're not able to use as many muscle fibers as an active movement, which is concentric. So concentric, increased signal, eccentric, decreased signal. Uh, muscle activation does not mean strength. So someone could have a low muscle activation, but be stronger than someone who has a higher muscle activation. And I know that sounds like kind of counterproductive. It sounds like it, that shouldn't be the way it is, but say, um, say you get a power lifter and a recreational lifter um, to do like this example right here, a goblet squat. Um, if the power lifter, the power lifter will probably have a lower EMG. I mean, they probably don't do goblet squats very much, but theoretically, theoretically, they would have a lower EMG than the, the recreational lifter at the same weight. Uh, the recreational lifter will probably have a higher signal, have like a higher EMG than the power lifter, but that doesn't mean that the recreational lifter is stronger than the power lifter. It just means that the recreational lifter is using more muscle fibers than the, uh, the power lifter. And that's because the power lifter is stronger, so they don't need to use as many muscle fibers as the recreational lifter. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> um, right here, a more active muscle can, yeah. So a more active muscle can generally produce more force. So a the, the power lifter, if they do a heavier weight, then they'll use more muscle fibers. And that means they'll be producing more force. Okay, so what the experiment is, we're gonna be using surface EMG. There is intramuscular EMG, I think is what it's called, but basically when you stick needles in the muscle, like more invasive technique um, to measure EMG, but thankfully we have a surface EMG so we don't have to stick anyone. Um, and this is what it looks like. These are the little electrodes. Um, little placements right here for the EMGs. Um, and it's called surface EMG for non-invasive assessment of muscles. Um, these are the experiments that we're gonna be doing. You'll see that in the video. Um, experiment one is a bicep curl. So muscle activation with different loads. I believe there are three different loads. Um, and then experiment two and three is the squat and the single leg deadlift, basically comparing activation between agonist and antagonist muscles, which are gonna be your hamstrings and your quads. Okay, so this is gonna be part, this is gonna make the lab make more sense because when you read it just as it is, it's like really confusing. Um, but basically, you have to do a maximum voluntary isometric contraction. And the reason you need to do this, MBIC, um, is to be able to compare it to other individuals and other muscles. So the only way you can compare these muscles, like the hamstring and the, uh, the quads, is if you do these MBICs. And basically, MBICs, um, 
they allow you to kind of put it into a percentage. So you do your MVIC for that muscle, your maximum isometric contraction, and then you can do the experiment. So the experiment that we're doing, say it's uh, the deadlift, you'll do your experiment. And then you can see, okay, this is the number I got for my hamstrings. I'm going to um, divide that by the MVIC, I'll get a percentage. And then, um, and then you can use that to compare to the same like activation between the squat or uh, the single leg deadlift. So hamstrings between the squat and the single leg, de single leg deadlift, um, the hamstrings between the single leg deadlift and the quads between the single leg deadlift. So that's how you can like compare. Um, and this normalizes it, the percentage normalizes it, you guys know. Um, and if it is over 100%, that means you didn't go all out in your MVIC. There's a bunch of limitations to this. Um, MVICs may not accurately represent the activation that you can get during like a uh, concentric contraction, blah, 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 but you don't need to worry about that right now. Um, yeah, divide mean EMG of the exercise by the peak EMG of the MVIC. That's a lot, <laughs> but basically take the experimental EMG and then divide it by the peak EMG that you took in the beginning. Uh, and then watch the videos. This is the the equation mean EMB, EMG divided by peak EMG, you get the percentage. And that's how you can compare to the different muscles. All right, and this is it. Um, turn this in normal times as you always do, nothing new. And yeah, thank you guys for watching and I will see you guys soon.